Welcome to another episode of China Update, where I provide you with the most up-to-date political, economic, and geostrategic analysis on the world's number two economy. My name is Tony. Let's jump in. Okay, happy Monday, everybody. Let's move through the developments from over the weekend and then move on to the economy. One quick piece of housekeeping before we begin. Like I said over the weekend, this week I will be in Hong Kong to meet with clients, and I have a speaking arrangement. I hope to take this opportunity to meet with viewers that are based in Hong Kong. So if you are in Hong Kong and you'd like to come to one of these meetups, send me an email at the email address in the description below. Give a brief introduction of yourself and let me know whether you can. Make the Thursday evening or Saturday noon meetup. I hope to see many of you in Hong Kong this week. First up, on Sunday yesterday, state-run Global Times, citing unnamed sources, reported that Beijing has launched an investigation into Foxconn over tax and land use issues. The other reports that tax authorities inspected Foxconn sites in the provinces of Guangdong and Jiangsu. And other officials had inspections at sites in Henan and Hubei. The massive Apple iPhone maker confirmed the reports, expressing in a statement that Foxconn would cooperate with the investigation. It is unclear what the issues really are. However, one particular statement in the state media report is telling. The Global Times quotes who they refer to as an expert as expressing, quote, "Taiwan-funded enterprises, including Foxconn, should also assume corresponding social responsibilities and play a positive role in promoting the peaceful development of cross-strait relations." End quote. Taiwan's presidential elections are coming up in January, something which we will be following closely in the coming months. Cross-strait relations will likely intensify as we move closer to the voting date. Terry Go, founder of Foxconn, who retains a 12.5% stake in the company, is running as an independent candidate. When he announced his presidential run in late August, Go acknowledged his vulnerability, expressing, quote, "If the Communist Party regime were to say, 'If you don't listen to me, I'll confiscate your assets from Foxconn,'" I would say, yes, please do it. I cannot comply with their orders. I won't be threatened. End quote. UK-based The Financial Times writes that Beijing has, in the past, targeted local subsidiaries of Taiwanese companies with regulatory probes and political pressures at sensitive or tense times. Quote, Chinese officials frequently urge Taiwanese companies to help promote peaceful development between the two sides. End quote. Next up, we move from one sensitive area to another. We have been following the simmering tensions in the South China Sea between the Philippines and China for a few months now. Another incident occurred over the weekend, which we need to take note of. The latest in a series of recent flashpoints between Beijing and Manila in the disputed waterway. On Sunday, China and the Philippines both accused each other of causing collisions in a disputed area of the South China Sea. The Philippine authorities, in an official statement, accused a Chinese Coast Guard ship of carrying out quote, "provocative, irresponsible, and illegal, dangerous blocking maneuvers" end quote, that caused it to collide with a Philippine vessel carrying supplies to troops stationed near Second Thomas Shoal. In the Spratly Island chain, regular viewers understand that the Philippines only has a window of a few months to shore up an intentionally grounded warship with stationed troops there before it falls apart and the PRC can move in to take possession. There was a second incident on Sunday too. This involved a Chinese maritime militia vessel colliding with a Philippine Coast Guard ship. On a similar mission to resupply the grounded navy transport ship, no injuries were reported in either collision. The Chinese Coast Guard, in a Sunday statement, rejected the Philippines' telling of the events, claiming that in both cases the Philippine ships were trespassing into what China claims to be its territorial waters, and that the Chinese side had to perform an intercept quote in accordance with the law. End quote. In 2016, an international tribunal in The Hague ruled in favor of the Philippines in a landmark maritime dispute, which concluded that China has no legal basis to claim historic rights to most of the South China Sea, including this area where these collisions took place over the weekend. Beijing rejects the ruling. 
Next up, in more positive news, also on Sunday, Australia's Prime Minister announced that he would be travelling to China from November the 4th to the 7th to meet with General Secretary Xi Jinping and Premier Li Qiang, saying that the trip will be to promote, quote, a stable and productive bilateral relationship, end quote. Since coming to office in 2022, the Labour government leader has sought to bring Sino-Australian relations back onto a more stable footing. Under the previous government, the relationship soured greatly. In 2020, after Beijing hit the country with painful trade restrictions in response to Canberra's calls for an international inquiry into the origins of the pandemic. Even before this, relations had been very bumpy, with Canberra seeking to protect itself against foreign interference in its elections. Despite historically high negative views of China from the population generally and greater military and security integration with the US in the region, China is still Australia's biggest trading partner, so economic interests have pushed the current government to repair ties. Beijing has thrown Canberra some small political wins, too, to ensure a smooth trip. In his Sunday statement, the Prime Minister said that on Saturday, the two sides had reached a deal to solve its World Trade Organization dispute over Australian wine, expressing, quote, We have agreed on the issue of wine for there to be a review of China's position on wine tariffs to be conducted over the next few months. We will suspend our action before the WTO, but we are very confident that this will result in once again Australian wine, a great product, being able to go to China free of the tariffs. End quote. Australian winemakers were hit particularly hard by the tariffs at rates over 200%. In 2019, Australian wine exports to China reached 800 million US dollars. Last year, these numbers collapsed to just 11 million US dollars. We also remember that Australian citizen Cheng Lei was also recently released from her detention in China. The November trip will be the first by an Australian leader since 2016. Next up, we discuss concerns that China is entering a period of protracted crisis. Hey everyone, if you enjoyed today's episode of China Update, don't forget to hit the like button. Sharing this with people who you think would get some value from it as well is also a big help. And for the 50% of regular viewers who are not subscribed, maybe consider subscribing so you're on top of the most up-to-date analysis as it's released. For those who want to go the extra mile and help me keep China Update financially sustainable, Patreon and Buy Me A Coffee links are in the description below. As always, thank you so much, everybody for the ongoing support. Finally, for today's video, we examine an excellent piece published by Marco Polo, an in-house think tank of the US-based Paulson Institute. The piece was written by two well-respected experts on China's economy and financial system, Damien Ma, managing director of Marco Polo, and Hu Song, a fellow at Marco Polo. We end today's video by examining the salient points made in the piece, which is called Marco Polo Econ Issue 19. China economy in debt, which we are now quoting directly. Like many, we have been grappling with what to make of the Chinese economy's prospects. It is evident that serious risks have built up, the manifestation of which is already apparent in the property sector. The key question is whether this is another cyclical speed bump, a tempest in a teapot, or the making of a protracted crisis. After much deliberation, we believe the answer veers toward the latter. China is likely heading into a messy and protracted debt debacle that will be at least equal in magnitude to the state-owned enterprises' debt dilemma in the late 1990s, except the outcome this time will likely be a protracted economic malaise. For two reasons. One, the macro conditions today are not nearly as favorable to China as they were 25 years ago. At a minimum, China will not be able to grow out of this problem like it did last time, helped in part by its entry into the World Trade Organization. Two, the main variable that determines the outcomes, the Chinese state's response, is more concerning than it has ever been in recent memory. These two factors are mutually reinforcing. 
because constraining China's response is the current leadership's strong pro-austerity stance. That stance is necessary from Beijing's point of view, as it appears committed to de-risking the economy over the next three years and preparing to take the pain that comes with it. The hope seems to be that after de-risking, the Chinese economy will normalize to its sustainable growth of perhaps 4 to 5 percent. While any significant adjustment period will be painful, such de-risking will not fundamentally solve the leverage problem because this is a feature, not a bug, of China's political economy. The current situation is simply a different manifestation of the same underlying ailment that also afflicted the late 1990s, the state sector's soft budget constraint. Back then, the crisis originated in state-owned enterprises. This time, it will hit local governments. What the two episodes share is state actors that actively participate in the economy without being subject to true market discipline to shape their behaviours. So long as this remains the underlying structural reality, China will have recurring debt cycles and taming them will ultimately be a Sisyphean task. The best that Beijing can hope for is to manage through these cycles with a proper balance between growth and deleveraging. Yet that balance seems absent from Beijing's current approach. Its pro-austerity stance, combined with the intent to vigorously pursue de-risking in a low-growth environment, is not an optimal recipe. Such an approach will ironically increase, rather than mitigate, risks to the economy. Beijing's current path will unintentionally, but likely, lead to a local debt crisis that will damage the regional banking sector. If our scenario materializes, the first order effect will likely depress China's growth prospects for the rest of this decade. Because this will mainly be a domestic debt debacle, the net impact on the global economy should be more modest, primarily hurting commodity exporters and certain Asian economies that have significant exposure to the Chinese economy. Here ends the direct quote and today's episode of China Update. Thank you so much, everybody, for watching. Have a lovely Monday. Have a productive week ahead. And I will see you all tomorrow.